Nvidia's latest RTX 3080 is here, so let's build an insane gaming PC build for 2020. I'm going to take you through the whole build process today, step by step, before booting this machine up and seeing exactly how this brand new graphics card performs. Now, as always, I'm going to kick things off by installing our CPU and RAM into the motherboard. And this is the Asus ROG Maximus 7 Hero. It's one of the best looking Z490 boards out there and crucially supports our i9 CPU choice today. And don't worry, I will have a Ryzen 7 RTX 3080 build coming very soon. Installing the CPU is pretty easy. You're going to pull up this retention arm and rest the socket cover just like so and line the golden triangle on our CPU with the bottom left corner of our motherboard socket. You may want to give it a little bit of a wiggle before popping the retention arm back down into place and this little black cover will fly straight off. Next up, I'm going to install the M.2 drive today. This is Adata's S40G. It's a super fast drive and it's got a little bit of RGB, which never hurts. And we're just going to slide the drive into our M.2 slot, just like so, securing it down with this included M.2 screw. The final step then of our motherboard assembly is to install our RAM or the memory. I've gone for two 16 gigabyte sticks of Thermaltake's tough RAM RGB. To install these, we're going to push back the clips on the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots and line the notch on our memory with the corresponding notch on our DIMM slot. With even pressure to both sides, it's going to clip nicely into place. And just like that, we're all sorted. The next stage then is to move the motherboard assembly into the case. And this is the Thermaltake V250. It's got a load of tempered glass and plenty of RGB fans, so it's gonna look sick for today's build. The first step with any case then is to actually take off both the side panels. That's gonna make it a lot, lot easier to work with. Inside the case, you're gonna find this bag of included case accessories, and this is gonna have all the screws and cables and stuff we need to install our motherboard into place. We're then just gonna check that under each of the holes on our motherboard, we've got a corresponding gold standoff located in the case. Before we actually go ahead and slide the motherboard board into the case. And I'm just going to screw the case down standoff by standoff. The next step today then is to install the CPU cooler and this is Thermaltake's new TH360ARGB. That's a bit of a mouthful. This is a 360ml all-in-one liquid cooler though and it's a great choice for today's build. Right, so I think I've figured this out. First things first, we need to remove the front panel on the case, which is going to come off nice and easily just like so. We then need to also remove these front three fans so that we can then screw them through the radiator of this Thermaltake TH360. Now that the radiator is in, we can whack the front panel back on. <coughs> Lovely stuff. We're then going to grab the back plate and on the Intel side, slot this through the rear of the motherboard. Before we finally secure the water block down, we're just going to pop a little bit of thermal paste on the CPU. That is more than enough. The next step then, before we go ahead and install the graphics card, which I know you're all excited for, is to pop in our power supply and do some of our cabling. It's easier to put this in now while we've still got easy access to the motherboard. This is an 850 watt unit from Thermaltake, which means it is sufficient for the new NVIDIA graphics card. It's also got an RGB fan to give us a bit of RGB underglow, which is a bit unnecessary, but it's going to look pretty cool. You then want to take the modular cables and first plug up a SATA power cable, followed by an 8-pin CPU power cable, a dual 6 plus 2-pin graphics card power connector, which we are going to adapt a bit later, and then finally our fat 24-pin motherboard power cable. And the power supply is going to slide fan-facing downwards into the back of the case. The first step then is to plug up our CPU power connector, which goes to the top left of the motherboard. Our 24-pin motherboard cable's next, and this goes to the right-hand side of the motherboard, just like so, and is the biggest connector of all today. We're also going to plug up our HD audio connector, and that goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. It's got a pin missing, so don't force it, and it will only go in one way round. Next up is USB 2. It looks very similar to HD audio, but has a different pin missing, and once again goes to the bottom of the motherboard. We're also going to plug up USB 3. This one can be a bit delicate and is keyed, so will only go in one way round. 
Finally, the last cable today are our front panel connectors. This is for our kind of power and reset buttons, hard drive indicator LEDs, and I will pop a diagram on your screen now to make this nice and easy to follow along with. Okay then, it's now time to install the graphics card. And this is Nvidia's brand new RTX 3080. With 10 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory, Nvidia's latest axial flow cooling design, more on that later, and basically twice the performance over last generation, this thing is an absolute beast. And of course, we're gonna put it to the test in the benchmarking section in just a moment's time. It's also got Nvidia's brand new 12 pin GPU power connector, which can deliver loads of juice in a really small form factor. Nvidia include an adapter for this cable, which shows just how small that new 12 pin standard is. This maximum performance improvement is really well demonstrated in ray tracing titles, where the 3080's 58 teraflops worth of RT calculations is a nice increase over, say, the 2080 Ti's 34 teraflops. All we then need to do is make sure our second and third PCIe slots have been removed before pushing the clip back on our motherboard slot and lining the graphics card slot, that's this gold connector, nicely into place. I actually can't get over how small that connector, how compact it really is. And I think with the graphics card in, we're now pretty much done. All that's left to do is whack in these extra fans we had left over from our radiator installation before booting this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Okay then, now you've seen how to put this system together and how good it looks, especially that 3080 when it's all powered up, let's dive in and see exactly how it performs. I've taken my usual selection of PC build gaming benchmarks and sprinkled in a few extra titles to really flex the muscles of this RTX 3080. So let's dive straight in. Apex Legends is first up, a bit of a classic, one of the most popular titles at the moment, and for good reason. Here we're seeing a 103 frames per second average with 85 and 80 frames per second on the 90 and 99th percentile results. And all of these are tested with Nvidia's FrameView application, which is a really great benchmarking tool. It's really incredible that you can get over 100 frames per second on average at 4K high settings. That's an insane amount of pixels and an insane amount of frames. The game, of course, looked fantastic. No stuttering, no lag, no screen tearing. So we're all good on this front. Call of Duty's Warzone is next up. Of course, the free battle royale that's taken the gaming world by absolute storm. Once again here at 4K high settings, you're looking over 100 frames per second, 108 on average to be precise, with 96 and 86 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Call of Duty's Warzone looks fantastic. Unfortunately, the free battle royale doesn't support ray tracing, so no impact on performance yet, but we will come on to that in a moment's time. Forza Horizon 4 is one of my personal favorite games, and at 4K ultra settings, you're looking at 141 frames per second on average, which is kind of insane. A racing game, as a general rule of thumb, you want 40 to 55 FPS. So 141 is great. And on the 90th and 99th percentile results, you're looking at 136 and 128 frames per second, respectively. This is a pretty drastic increase over my RTX 2080 Super, which saw 90, 89 and 85 frames per second, respectively, in the Forza Horizon 4 benchmarking mode. Next up today then, we've got a bit of Fortnite RTX. Fortnite now supports ray tracing and DLSS for those of you that don't know. And with DLSS set to performance mode, where it renders the game at a low resolution and uses AI to scale it back up, uh, with ray tracing enabled and all the little toggles turned on, you look in 77 frames per second on average, with 63 and 56 for the 90th and 99th percentile results. The game looked great, and honestly, I think ray tracing in Fortnite might be my favourite RTX implementation yet. 
Because of how kind of cartoony the game is, it makes it feel that much more realistic and visually makes the game actually pretty stunning. Having DLSS as well involved to combat any performance hit from ray tracing really, really helps. And if you wanted to drop down to 1440p, you'd be able to get around about 100 frames per second. And equally with RTX on, you're gonna be seeing well over 150, 160 frames per second. Next up then, we've got a cheeky bit of Doom Eternal. Not a ray tracing or a DLSS type, Title, but something that was very heavy on rasterization at 4K Ultra Nightmare. I mean, what an incredible name for a preset. With, of course, VSync disabled across the board, you look at an average of 145 frames per second, with 131 and 128 FPS on your 90th and 99th percentiles. Next up, then, we've got Death Stranding, one of the standout DLSS titles today. And at kind of default settings, 4K with DLSS set to performance mode, you're looking 95 FPS on average, with 85 and 75 for your 90th and 99th percentile results. Visually, the game is super duper realistic. And to get these kind of frame rates at 4K and what is very much so an open world title where you're rendering just a huge amount of data every single frame is really quite impressive. Next up then we've got Control and I also tested Control alongside a couple of other titles with the RTX 2080 Super as well to see exactly what kind of performance benefit we're getting. Here at 4K very high settings with RTX on high and DLSS set to 1440p with a native resolution of 4K. So rendering at 1440p using AI to scale up to 4K, you look in 86 FPS average for the RTX 3080 and 42 FPS on average with the 2080 Super super. Now that performance increase is huge. I did retest it a couple of times and actually goes above Nvidia's claim of a 100% increase with the last gen RTX 2080. But I'm not complaining. Uh, we'll take those kind of frame rates any day. Grand Theft Auto 5 is next up at 4K high settings on an RTX 3080. You're looking on average 107 FPS, which is an increase of the 71 FPS average that I saw with an RTX 2080 Super. Uh, the 90th and 99th percentiles for both of those will be on your screen now as well. And both of these were tested uh, with the GTA 5 inbuilt gaming benchmark. So the results are super repeatable. And if you want to go back and check against my other builds as well, you can absolutely do so. Next up then, we've got Battlefield 5, of course, one of the very first ray tracing titles and something that was really quite difficult to run. I'm happy to report though here that at 4K high settings with all the RTX settings turned on, as well as of course DLSS, we're looking at 89 frames per second average with 84 and 83 for the 90th and 99th percentiles. More importantly though, the game flows really well, looks fantastic, and I think is still one of the best examples of ray tracing on the market. And this 3080 runs it with no problems at all. Overwatch then is one of the last games on my list today. It's something that I always benchmark, I always test, so you can go and compare really easily. And with this RTX 3080, we see an average frames per second of 191 at 4K epic settings. So the epic preset, which looks incredible. And once again, no complaints from me. Overwatch is a little bit of an easier game to run, but still pushing this many pixels on that really high preset is quite a feat. The final game then is CSGO, just for fun. We know the frame rate's gonna be really high, and it was. At 4K Ultra, you look at an average of 212 frames per second. All in all, I've been really, really impressed with this RTX 3080. Performance-wise, it's pretty incredible. And the claims from NVIDIA of these huge performance increases over last generation, especially in RTX titles, certainly stands to be true. I guess the biggest question though is whether you'll actually be able to get your hands on one in time for Christmas. I'll be doing lots more RTX 3080 and hopefully 3070 and 3090 builds very soon. So make sure to get subscribed so you don't miss those. Thank you very much for watching though and we'll see you as always in the next one.